Good day everyone, this is Doc Ina and the lecture is on fetal possession. To download this lecture deck for free, go to slideshare.net or go to my WordPress site. These are the references for this lecture, Williams Obstetrics 24th edition, chapter 22, The Normal Labor, and Textbook of Obstetrics 3rd edition by Sampaiko et al, tw chapter 24, The Passenger. This is the outline of our lecture. So first we talk about the fetal attitude. Fetal attitude is also called fetal posture or habitus. This is the relationship of the fetal head to the fetal back or the extremities. Now we have what we call universal flexion. So as a rule, the fetus forms an ovoid mass that corresponds roughly to the shape of the uterine cavity. Take a look at, pic take a look at the picture at the, the right. And this is what we call universal flexion, where the fetus becomes folded or bent upon itself in such a manner that the back becomes markedly convex and the head is sharply flexed so that the chin is almost in contact with the chest. The thighs are also flexed over the abdomen and the legs are bent at the knees. So as I've mentioned, in a universal flexion posture, the fetal head is flexed or with the chin coming in contact with the chest. However, in a fetus in face presentation, the head is extended or directed towards the fetal back. Sometimes the occiput is almost touching the fetal back. The next terminology is fetal lie. This is the relationship of the long axis of the fetus to the long axis of the maternal abdomen. So in a fetus in longitudinal lie, the fetal axis is along the long axis of the maternal abdomen. However, in a fetus in transverse lie, the fetal axis is at right angles to the maternal axis. In a fetal oblique lie, the position of the fetus is slanting or oblique or around 45 degrees to the maternal axis. So the next terminology is fetal presentation. This is the portion of the body of the fetus that is foremost within the birth canal or in closest proximity to it. It can be cephalic, breech, shoulder, or compound. In this picture, this fetus is in longitudinal lie and cephalic presentation or vertex presentation because the head is foremost within the birth canal. In the next picture, we have a breech presentation because the breech is foremost within the birth canal. Under cephalic presentation, we have different types, the vertex, incipit, brow, and face. So in a vertex presentation, the occiput is presenting. In a sinciput presentation, the anterior fontanelle or the bregma is presenting. In a brow presentation, the fetal brow is presenting. And lastly, in a face presentation, the fetal face is presenting. For breech presentation, the bitrochanteric diameter is the one presenting. And we have basically three types of breech presentation, the frank, complete, and incomplete breech. For frank breech, the fetal thighs are flexed and the knees are extended. For complete breech, both the fetal thighs and the knees are flexed. In incomplete breech, the thighs are flexed but only one of the knees is flexed and the other one is extended. Sometimes the foot prolapses through the birth canal and that's why sometimes this one is called footling breech. For shoulder presentation, the shoulder or acromion is presenting in the pelvic inlet. In the compound presentation, the fetal hand or the foot prolapses alongside the presenting vertex or the breech. Fetal position is the relationship of the chosen portion of the fetal presenting part in reference to one of the four quadrants or transverse diameter of the birth canal. So to be able to know the fetal position, you have to first draw an imaginary cross in the pelvic cavity. 
and then next is you have to know which is the anterior and which is the posterior and the maternal left and right based on anatomical landmarks so this is posterior because this is where the sacrum is this is anterior because that is where the symphysis pubis is this is the maternal left and this is the maternal right so again just to illustrate Notice here that the fetus is in cephalic or vertex position and therefore our reference point or determining point is the occiput. This is the maternal left. This is the maternal right. This is anterior because this is where the symphysis pubis is. This is posterior because this is where the sacrum is. And again, draw an imaginary cross in the pelvic cavity. So, anything above this transverse line is anterior and anything below that is posterior. So, in this case, the position of the fetus is left occiput anterior. Approximately two-thirds of all vertex presentations are in the left occiput position and one-third in the right occiput position. So at this point, we will do some exercises so you will practice how to determine fetal position. So now the scenario is, imagine yourself as the OB gynecologist who will deliver this baby. So your patient, who is the mother, is in a dorsal lithotomy position and you are facing her perineum area. So now let's practice. A few slides back, I told you that the first thing to do is to draw an imaginary cross in the pelvic cavity to divide this into four quadrants. Next is to uh, determine which is the anterior, the posterior, the maternal left, and the maternal right. So in this case, we have this is the anterior because this is where the symphysis pubis is. This is the posterior because this is where the sacrum is. This is the maternal left and the maternal right. So notice that the fetus is in vertex or cephalic presentation and therefore our determining point or the reference point will be the occiput. So the answer to this is left occiput anterior. For letter B, we have left occiput posterior because notice that the occiput is pointing down. Okay. Next is right occiput posterior and lastly this is right occiput transverse because you notice that the occiput is along the transverse line so in defining position the following determining points are used so i've told you about the occiput as the reference or determining point if the fetus is in cephalic or cephalic or vertex presentation Mentum or chin is the determining point for a face presentation, the sacrum if the fetus is in the breech presentation, and the acromion or scapula if the fetus is in shoulder presentation. Okay, let's do more exercises. Okay, so in this case, what is the fetal presentation? So notice that the fetus is in face presentation and therefore our determining or reference point will be the chin or mentum. So in this case, we have left mentum anterior, right mentum anterior, right mentum posterior. And in the last case, we have a transverse lie, a fetus in a transverse lie with the shoulder presenting. So, a reference point would be the shoulder or the acromion. So, this is right dorsal acromion. Several methods can be used to diagnose fetal presentation and position. First is we do abdominal palpation or the Leupold's maneuvers. And then do a vaginal examination, auscultation, sonography or ultrasound, and rarely plain radiographs, computed tomography, or magnetic resonance imaging may be used. With the onset of labor and after cervical dilatation, the vertex presentations and their positions are recognized by palpation of the various fetal sutures and fontanelles. 
the face and the breech presentations are identified by palpation of the facial features and fetal sacrum. First, the examiner inserts two fingers into the vagina and the presenting part is found. Second, if the vertex is presenting, the fingers are directed posteriorly and then swept forward over the fetal head towards the maternal symphysis pubis. Next, the positions of the two fontanelles are ascertained. Fingers are passed to the most anterior extension of the sagittal suture and the fontanelle encountered there is examined and identified. With the sweeping motion, the fingers pass along the suture to the other end of the head until the other fontanelle is felt and differentiated. Now for the last part of this lecture, I will teach you how to do Leopold's maneuvers. Leopold's maneuver is an abdominal exam to determine fetal presentation. So we have four Leopold's maneuver. The first is Leopold's maneuver 1 or LM1 which is also called the fundal grip. The uterine fundus is palpated to determine which fetal part is occupying the fundus. So if you feel a round and hard palatable part, then that would be the fetal head. And if you feel a large nodular mass in the uterine fundus, then that would be the fetal breech. So in this picture, LM1 is breech. Leopold's maneuver 2 or LM2 is also called the umbilical grip. This is palpation of the paraumbilical areas or the sides of the uterus to determine which side is the fetal back and which side are the fetal parts. So if you feel a hard resistant convex structure, that's the fetal back, or if you feel nodular or irregular small parts, those are the fetal small parts. So in this picture, fetal back is on the left side of the mother or fetal back left. The Leopold's maneuver 3 or LM3 is also called the Paulex grip. This is the suprapubic palpation using the thumb and fingers just above the symphysis pubis to determine fetal presentation and station. We want to know which fetal part is foremost in the birth canal. Now the differentiation between the head and the breech is made as in LM1. So in, so in this picture, LM3 is cephalic. So the last maneuver is LM4 or Leopold's maneuver number 4 which is also called pelvic grip. This is palpation of the bilateral lower quadrants to determine engagement of the fetal presenting part. So the if the fetal part is engaged then the examiner's hands diverge or if the fetal head is not engaged then the examiner's hands converge. So in this picture we report LM4 as fetus not engaged. LM4 is the only maneuver where you as the examiner face the maternal feet because in the first three maneuvers, LM1 to LM3, you examine the patient facing the patient's head. So in summary, we have discussed different terminologies such as the fetal attitude, fetal lie, fetal presentation, and I taught you also how to determine fetal position and do Leopold's maneuvers. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to this channel.